So good afternoon, everyone. I would like to begin by thanking the Bibliographic Society of America for inviting me to present a portion of my dissertation research this afternoon. And in particular, I'd like to thank Erin McGurl, Jenna Dagdagen, Barbara Heritage, and the entire New Scholars Committee for their support. The title of my presentation today is A Revised Account of the 1714 Works of Mr. William Shakespeare. In 1709, the London bookseller, Jacob Tonson, published the first 18th century edition of William Shakespeare's plays. Previously, Shakespeare's collected works had appeared only in single volume folio format. Tonson's 1709 edition of Shakespeare's works introduced a series of radical changes in organization and in layout. Printed in a compact octavo format, it was published as a six volume set accompanied by engravings. Perhaps most significantly, Tonson commissioned the playwright and translator, Nicholas Rowe, to edit the plays. Rowe's name appeared prominently on the title page beneath the advertisement, revised and corrected. At the time, Rowe was one of the most famous playwrights in London. And in 1715, he became the poet laureate. Now, Tonson chose him to edit Shakespeare no doubt because of Rowe's familiarity with drama. But Tonson also understood the appeal of a famous name like Rose, and there can be little doubt that Rowe was chosen in part because of his marketability. Within the text of the 1709 edition itself, Rowe standardized the plays by inserting scene locations and dramatis personae lists. He regularized spelling and added a series of stage directions. He was, in other words, the first 18th century editor and the first named editor of Shakespeare's works. Rowe also wrote the first biography of Shakespeare, which was appended to all subsequent editions of the plays up until 1790. Yet in December of 1714, just five years after the release of the 1709 works, Tonson published another edition of Shakespeare's plays. This 1714 edition was an updated version of the 1709 edition. It was printed in the even more compact duodecimo format with new engravings and a new index. It also contained, importantly, new revisions to the text. The 1714 edition came out in various issues with various title pages, but in the third and final issue to appear, there was a curious alteration in the attribution given to Nicholas Rowe. Though Rowe is still credited with having written the biography, the explicit reference to his editorial endeavors, the key phrase revised and corrected was entirely removed. It seems in other words, that Rowe was being demoted. Scholars have long suspected that Rowe's involvement in the 1714 edition of Shakespeare's works was minimal. Yet this hypothesis has, until now, rested on a single piece of documentary evidence, a manuscript receipt held at the Folger Shakespeare Library entitled Paid to the Editors of Shakespeare. It lists a certain Mr. Hughes as the recipient of 28 pounds and seven pence. Scholars have deduced from this list that it was the slightly more obscure playwright and librettist John Hughes and not Nicholas Rowe who edited the 1714 edition of the works. Yet this manuscript list does not offer conclusive evidence. Citing paleographic evidence, Barbara Mowat has noted that the list could not have been prepared before 1740. Its description of payments made at least 25 years earlier are perhaps of limited value. It's also possible that the entry for Hughes um, refers not to his editing of Shakespeare, but rather to editorial contributions that he made to other Tonson projects. For instance, in 1715, Hughes edited a new edition of Edmund Spencer's works. And there's evidence to suggest that he was the anonymous editor of a 1719 edition of Paradise Lost. It's possible then that his name appeared on the list of payments for Shakespeare by mistake. To put it briefly, 
while the Folger receipt offers compelling evidence about Hughes's involvement in the 1714 edition, it does not provide any sort of firm proof. This afternoon, I would like to present some new evidence that might help us understand who did, or rather who did not, edit the edition of 1714. I cannot provide any additional hard proof linking the edition to Hughes. However, I hope to show that there are at least two good reasons to believe that Roe was not involved in editing the edition of 1714. First, by looking beyond Roe's editorial career and by examining his career as a playwright, we can deduce that starting in 1713, he seemed to have ceased working with Tonson. Second, and perhaps more significantly, there is bibliographical evidence to suggest that the person who revised the edition of 1714 did not have the same editorial strategies or access to the same source texts as the editor of 1709. First then, let us consider the professional relationship between Rowe and Tonson. Even before he edited the Shakespeare edition of 1709, Rowe was one of London's leading playwrights, and Tonson had published almost all of his literary works. Between 1702 and 1708, Tonson was Rowe's exclusive publisher, printing all five of his major plays, including The Fair Penitent, the great theatrical hit of 1703. However, on December 12th of 1713, Rowe signed a contract with Tonson's rival bookseller, Bernard Lintot, for the rights to the forthcoming play entitled The Tragedy of Jane Shore. Lintot was the preferred publisher of Alexander Pope, a poet with whom Rowe had become unusually intimate starting in about 1712, and who, it would seem, negotiated the deal between Lintot and Rowe. Lintot paid Rowe 50 pounds and 15 pence for the rights to publish the text of Jane Shore. This was an unusually large sum of money. In fact, 50 pounds and 15 pence was the largest copyright fee that Lintot had ever paid to any author up to that point in his publishing career. And just a few years later, in April of 1715, Lintot paid another remarkable fee of 75 pounds and five pence to acquire the rights to Rowe's next play, The Tragedy of Lady Jane Grey. This reminds us that Rowe's name was a very valuable commodity, particularly in the years between 1713 and 1715. In 1715, Alexander Pope, perhaps pleased with his own role in seducing Rowe away from Tonson, and orchestrating the deal with Lintot, commemorated the event in his poem entitled A Farewell to London. In the fifth quatrain, the Pope turned his attention to Rowe's shifting allegiances. Lintot, farewell thy bard must go, farewell unhappy Tonson. Heaven gives thee for thy loss of Rowe, lean Phillips and fat Johnson. The bard in this quatrain is Pope himself, who, because he's fleeing London on account of recent anti-Catholic legislation, must bid farewell to his publisher, Clintock. Tonson, meanwhile, must bid farewell to Rowe, and must do as make do instead with the poet with the poet Ambrose Phillips and the playwright Charles Johnson. Poor substitutes, it would seem, for the marketability and the prestige of a name like Nicholas Rose. It's reasonable to speculate, I think, that Rowe was not on the best terms with Tonson between 1713 and 1715, and that Lintot outbid Tonson for Rowe's allegiances. This is helpful context, but it of course does not in and of itself prove that Rowe did not edit the 1714 works of Mr. William Shakespeare. I would like now to turn to more substantive bibliographical evidence that speaks more convincingly, I think, to Rowe's limited involvement in that 1714 edition. When Rowe first edited the 1709 edition of Shakespeare's works, he used the 1685 fourth folio edition 
of Shakespeare's plays as his copy text, with occasional reference to earlier quartos, in the case, for instance, of Hamlet. The 1714 edition, meanwhile, used the 1709 edition as a copy text. It adopted all of the paratextual devices originally inserted by Rowe in 1709, the dramatis personae lists, the stage directions, the speech prefixes, and for the most part, the reviewer of 1714 agreed with Rowe's standardizations of spelling and of punctuation. Yet, the 1714 edition also introduced a series of new readings. Some of these appear to have been new and unique conjectures, but many of them suggest that the editor of 1714 had a copy of the second folio of 1632 on hand, and that he frequently checked Rowe's readings against that earlier folio text. Note, for instance, the difference between this passage from The Tempest in the 1709 edition and the same passage in the 1714 edition. This is in the opening section of Act One, Scene Two, during which Prospero finally agrees to tell his daughter Miranda about the circumstances that led to their expulsion from Milan. Tis true, I must inform thee further, says Prospero in the 1709 version of the text. In the 1714 edition, meanwhile, Prospero says, tis time I must inform thee further. And just further down the page, we see another variation. Prospero reassures Miranda that nobody has been hurt in the violent tempest that was staged in Act 1, Scene 1. And then he demands that she sit still so that he can tell her his story. There is no soul lost, he says. No, not so much perdition as a hair, but tied to any creature in the vessel, which thou heardst cry, which thou sawst sink. Sit down, for thou must now know further. The wording in both 1709 and 1714 is identical. However, note the change in the lineation of 1714. The phrase sit down is moved up from the beginning of the final line of the speech to the end of the penultimate line. These alterations are not original to 1714. The Tempest was first printed in the first folio of 1623, and it was subsequently printed in the second folio of 1632, the third folio of 1664, and the fourth folio of 1685. Examining this passage as it appears in these earlier folios reveals the source of the 1714 reading. Let's begin with the fourth and third folios. We see that the fourth folio has the word true, and it has sit down on the final line of the speech. That matches the text of 1709, which is what we'd expect, but it doesn't match 1714. We see that the third folio has the word time, and it has sit down on the final line. That matches neither 1714 nor 1709. So, this is one of the examples that rules out the third folio as a copy text for either of those editions. Both the first and second folios, meanwhile, have time and both have sit down crammed onto the pen ultimate line of the speech. The 1709 edition, therefore, matches neither F1 nor F2, while the 1714 edition matches both. How do we know then that the 1714 edition was based on the second folio and not on the first folio? Well, there's evidence in other plays that rules out the first folio. Here, for instance, is a convenient example from Hamlet. The spelling of the name Rosencrantz differs in 1709 and 1714. 1709 has Rosenerus, whereas 1714 has Rosencross. This is an interesting example because it actually seems that the 1709 edition goes all the way back to the second quarto of 1605, which has Rosencross. The first folio, meanwhile, has Rosencrantz, while the second, third, and fourth folios all have Rosencross. Clearly, 
the reviser of 1714 is correcting the reading that was found in 1709, but is not basing it on the first folio. Otherwise, we would expect to find Rosencrantz in 1714, not Rosencross. This is one example then that can help us determine that the folio text consulted by the editor of 1714 was almost certainly the second folio of 1632. Although there is no single principle governing when and why the reviser of 1714 reverts to F2 readings, there are certainly a series of patterns that emerge. For instance, let's take again the example from the first scene of The Tempest. In reverting to the 1632 reading, the editor of 1714 appears to be smoothing out a metrical incongruity. As it appears in the 1709 text, the line, which thou heardst cry, which thou sawst sink, is short. It only contains eight syllables, whereas of course, in regular iambic pentameter, we expect 10 syllables. By moving the phrase sit down up, the line is rendered regular. There are other similar examples scattered throughout the play. In The Tempest alone, I've counted at least 30 places where 1714 reverts to second folio readings. Of these, seven are in cases where the second folio reading creates a more metrically perfect line. Changes like these are particularly interesting because they suggest that the person who was revising the text of 1714 was not merely proofreading the 1709 copy text. They were concerned with questions of style. The decisions they made were distinct from the decisions made by Rowe in 1709, both in terms of aesthetics and in terms of their textual source. Can we know for certain that the person who made these changes was the Mr. Hughes who appeared on the Folger receipt? No. But what I hope to have shown today is that the person who made these changes was probably not Nicholas Rowe. Rowe, of course, remained on the title page, a clever tactic on Tonson's part, since as the battle with Lintot shows, Rose was a valuable and marketable name. Yet the slippage of his attribution on the title page and the removal of revised and corrected might point to the more complex reality, to the fact that the addition was in fact overseen by another editor, one with different aesthetic values and access to different texts. This is a small detail perhaps in the long history of Shakespearean textual transmission, but it is one that should nonetheless encourage us to revise and correct our own understanding of 18th century editorial history. Thank you.